you know, just trying to t stay consistent with the little things. When I was a young coach, I heard somebody say at a clinic about, man, you're either coaching things, you know, you're encouraging or correcting, or you're allowing things to be wrong. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today, we are joined by the former head boys basketball coach at Burke Burnett High School, Danny Nix. Coach Nix finished his 43 year career with 866 wins, all of those wins being at Burke Burnett. Included in that win total are 19 district championships, 11 regional tournament appearances, and two trips to the state tournament. Coach Nix was recently named among the top 100 basketball coaches of the past century by the UIL. He's the winningest Texas high school basketball coach with all the wins at one high school. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. What's up, Coach? Hi, Matt. How are you? Oh, man, I'm great. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Hey, thank you so much for, for giving up your time and you know coming on here talking some hoops with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's great. I enjoy it. Also, I wanted to just congratulate you and say just thank you for uh, uh, 40, 40 plus years of, of teaching and coaching and, and just what an incredible career you've had, man. Well, thank you very much. I've been a, a very lucky coach through all of it. Well, I, I just mentioned it, you know, 40 plus years, uh, 866 wins. It's just a, a crazy number to think about. In your, in your opinion, over those years, how does the standards, your pillars, or your culture drive the performance of your program? Oh, well, I, I tell you what, I think that's everything, really. And, and um, I think it is in any successful program, but I know it's, it's the backbone of any success that, that we've had. Uh, you know, gosh, uh, we just have always wanted happy players. And I think the culture, you know, we're, we're going to get our guys, you know, the coaches that uh, like the Minnesota football coach, row the boat, you know, get guys that are in your boat and, and they're going to row and they're not bitching or complaining or whining. You know, they're, they're happy to be part of what you're doing, I think, is the most important thing that, that you can establish to try to be a successful program. Uh, we've never had a very good team, I felt like, that didn't have – you know, a great bench, a great mm -hmm. um, investment by everybody, managers, filmers, teammates, you know, guys that weren't playing as much as they wanted to. And uh, when everybody's all in like that, man, you, you know, you can accomplish so much. So I really believe that that's, uh, you know, for what we try to do, that's the most important thing. And, and you know, we always have sold guys on, um, you know, we just want you to be happy. Everybody needs to be happy. So if you're not happy sitting in the bench, you know, sitting on the bench, well, you need to do something else. And mm. uh, uh, we we always say to our guys, there's there's better players walking the halls, and we really believe that. But they're in this, you know, they're for whatever reason, guys that couldn't buy in or be invested in what we wanted to do. So, you know, I, I think that that's probably the most important thing that we've ever done around here to be successful. You know, I. I played for the legendary Tommy Thomas, and I, I felt that way uh, about kind of the culture that that he created. There, uh, there were times where I thought, man, there are a couple guys in our school at the colony that they they could be taking some time from me, but they didn't seem to be um, all in, like you said, in Coach T's vision or where the program was going. How hard of a decision was that over the years to? let some of those guys go that you know might have actually helped you on the floor possibly win some games? Well, uh, first of all, Coach T and I go way back. So we're very similar. <laughs> We've been friends for decades, and uh, I miss him. I haven't seen him in a while. Nobody yeah. liked that guy. But He's uh, unique. Yep. Nobody liked him. <laughs> yeah. I've never been around him where I just didn't die laughing, okay? And no matter when it was, you were going to laugh. That's right. I love it. Yeah. 
but um, that that's difficult. You know, that, that's hard for any coach. But uh, you know, when they're good good players, or they might be really good athletes, but you know, you're asking everybody to come to open gym and they never show. You're asking guys to stay a little longer in the weight room and they're the first guy out the door or to stick around and, hey, everybody's going to shoot, you know, and they're the, they're the first guy out the door. I, I just never coached those guys very well. Mm. And um, I'm always upset. And, and uh, you know, we got other guys that are working as hard as they possibly can. They're they're staying late. They're doing everything you ask. Uh, that That's who I want. And it's difficult when, you know, they might jump higher or, actually be better basketball players than the guys you have. But at the end of the day, I just think you'll accomplish more. And it's a 10 times more fun when you have guys that are, you know, all in. I think that's a huge nugget that you said, coaching guys that you enjoy, you know, having around that seem to share the same values. Because I think so many times you, you maybe hear stories about um, coaches compromising or changing things for more talented players. But I wonder how much that really just eats at the coach a little bit, you know, that, that, that their standards, they're lowering their standards to enable a more talented player. But over the years, you've been able to kind of stand firm, uh, you know, through that. Well, you know, like I said uh, previously, it's, it's not easy. And, you know, we all sit there and say, good gosh, this guy could really help us, you know. And uh, but but once again, you know, it, it's, it, you know, being part of a basketball team, coaching it or playing on it, it, it ought to be an enjoyable, fun experience. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think one of the biggest compliments that I've ever been paid in, in our coaches, our program is, uh, you know, when kids say, man, we have fun and because we work extremely hard. I'm a long hour practice guy. I always read about guys working out 90 minutes. I'm thinking, my gosh, I must not be very good at it because <laughs> I can't get anything done in 90 minutes. So we work out really, you know, long hours. And, and you know, for guys to say, man, it's fun. We have fun. Everybody, you know, has a good time. I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. I know the last – I mean, I, I've only been doing this 15 years, Coach, so I'm, I'm nowhere as near uh, uh, where, where you are – but I, I feel like there has been a shift to, uh, and I don't know, in the last five, 10 years, maybe 15 or 20, that a, a little bit more about player enjoyment, like them actually make the awareness of coaches, of uh, are our players enjoying being at practice, being a part of the program? Do they feel valued here? At what point, have you always been that way? Or was there a shift or a time maybe early on where you thought, well, this isn't working and I need to try something different. Well, I certainly did that. You know, uh, the the college coach that I played for, you know, uh, played for Mr. Iba at, at Oklahoma State and wow. Joe Stockton at Midwestern. And, um, you know, so there, even though we didn't play uh, super slow in college, there was a lot of that slower background. So, you know, I started off as a slow down type guy. All of my former players are still around that had to play with that, uh, they come back and say, well, dude, what are we doing? <laughs> we're running up down the floor launching threes and we had to pass it three or four times, you know, and so, yeah. you know, I, I made a big uh, uh, philosophy change early on and, and uh, I, it, that fun and, and enjoying things had a lot to do with it. The three point guy, line came in the late eighties, I believe it was 87, 88, right in there. Uh, we always had a lot of guys that there weren't a lot of difference in ability in, you know, being an Air Force uh, related school, the Air Force mm -hmm. base related school like we are. A lot of in and out, a lot of guys, you know, that that like basketball and could play and and uh, it, you know, it, it, it's more fun. I don't care who you are to uh, play <laughs> an 85-80 game than it is a 40-35 game. And, uh, you know, so we just, we, we kind of switched and, and uh, you know, uh, numbers increased dramatically um, through the years, you know, for a smaller school, a lot of years we would run four and five teams and, uh, you know, e each year. And, and I think a lot of that had to, to do with it just, you know, while we didn't sacrifice, you know, hard work, we, we made it fun and enjoyable and, and that was a change that I'm really glad I made.
The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. I think being in any profession for 40 plus years is, is hard to do. It's incredible. I think you see people, burnout is real. They, they get called to do other things. And what are, what daily habits, you know, allowed you to have success in, in your field for so long? Well, you know, I just, uh, first of all, uh, man, I, I couldn't have worked at a better place. You know, people people stay up here, uh, an ex-superintendent over 30 years, principal mm. decades, and and you just don't see that very often. But it's it's a fantastic place where administration is great. I've, I've just been blessed to have that. And and for personally, you know, uh, just I've always was happy. The very first year I got my head coaching job in 1982, um, I saw Jim Baldano speak in um, Fort Worth. Mm. And one of the things he talked about was, uh, you know, coaches too many times mess with happy. Dick Vitale in one of his books even mentioned that when he left to go from the University of Detroit to the Pistons, that Jim, Van, Jim Valvano chewed him out and told him, you're messing with happy. I think Coach Valvano used another verb instead of messing <laughs> with happy. But anyway, that always stuck with me. And, and you know, my family was happy. and. And I was happy and things were, were going great. So personally, that's one thing I think that, that allowed us to be successful was just a, a great, great situation. I wish every coach could have the support um, from a community, from a school, from administration, from assistant coaches that I went through. I mean, it, they, those, those factors, I see so many places where it's difficult and, and, you know, like, the old saying, a great job can come, become a bad job with one hire. And it's so true. And, but I've, I've been fortunate enough in my daily habits to uh, just to be able to deal with, uh, you know, a fantastic place. This Shangri-La, really. And, uh, you know, then for our, our program, man, I don't know, you know, that's me personally, really. But uh, for our program, man, I think some daily things was that uh, – you know, just trying to t stay consistent with the little things. When I was a young coach, I heard somebody say at a clinic about, man, you're either coaching things, you know, you're encouraging or correcting or you're allowing things to be wrong. Mm -hmm. That always stuck with me in every single drill. You know, a guy can get down lower, lower, you know, uh, or dribble with your proper hand or throw great passes in every single drill every day. You know, just little bitty things like that. Um uh, the coach was talking about felt like somebody asking a question felt like that that made the difference that you 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 didn't have to harp on it you didn't stop the drill but man you just corrected on the fly or praised on the fly hey great job that's what i'm talking about super great pass that's why he made the three-pointer you know and so you know for basketball wise daily habits like that i think that's something we we try to emphasize every day that that made us successful you know, we're an up-tempo program, and um, uh, in 2011, we got beat in the state championship game, and, and in that year, we averaged 84 points a game and took 75 shots. We have a goal. We want to get 80 shots. We, wouldn't, we never really uh, get to that very seldom, or we never averaged it. We get to it sometimes. And, um, uh, you know, we had an excellent team, and we averaged 11 turnovers a game, a little over 11 turnovers. And um, through the years, I went back and looked before, and, uh, you know, we'd average about 75 points a game and, and uh, 67, 68 shots and right at 14 to 15 turnovers a game. That's That's been our average. Mm -hmm. But but every day, every drill, man, we just – we kill on turnovers. You can't try something. we got to get the ball to the rim. You can't be sloppy. You can't, you, can't, you know, throw uh, passes that you think might get there. We've got to get – the ball to the rim so we have a chance to offensive rebound and it's something we emphasize every day and I think it it truly helped us. I think that's a common misconception that if you are going to play faster that automatically your turnovers are going to shoot up or, or it's just going to be chaotic or or 
ugly basketball, but I, I've seen, and I, I think you have too, because the pace that you play averaging 11 turnovers, that's incredibly efficient with what you're doing. It doesn't happen though, if you're not harping on those small details every day. And I love the fact that you talked about not just coaching the negative things that you see, but praising the positive because those other players hear the positives that you're praising and most likely they want to do that too. Exactly. I'm in total agreement there. You know, uh, anytime, you know, that, that's just human nature. I think that, uh, you know, a kid standing there and he hears, you know, the coach praising someone, Hey, that's it. That's the pass, you know, or, or that's the way to get down lower or that's what I'm talking about. But, you know, they, they see that too. So, you know, I, I think it's very important. One one reoccurring theme um, already just in talking with you is the, the joy, um, being happy, you know, loving what you do. I, I think I hear maybe in social media sometimes you, you see the good stuff, but you also hear complaining from people or you even talk to some coaches and they just seem miserable. What What's your advice to, like, is coaching uh, – a joy to do high school coaching a joy to do or is it really hard and and maybe it's both but what's your advice to those coaches that just seem to be kind of miserable in in what they're doing well I think you 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 hit the nail on the head right there I think it is both I think it's you know I think coaching is hard and a lot of people don't realize you know hours and work and preparation and um you know, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's, it can be a, a, a hard thing, but, you know, um, and I, I just felt like I never worked a day in, in my life. You know, I'm, I'm getting to mess with a basketball team. I've, I've played or coached on a basketball team since I was 12 years old. Hmm. So going forward, it's probably going to be a little bit of a change, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you do over Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays besides play games and practice. You know, what are you, you going to do with all your time, coach? Yeah, no kidding. I'll, I'll find something. But, but um, you know, I, I just – I think sometimes uh, – and that goes back to your situation to me. Man, I just had great support here. You know, I wasn't dealing with – administration or um, I'm, I'll knock on wood on this. I'm not a, uh, you know, parents. I've, I've, I just have had minimal, minimal mm. parent problems here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll visit with any parent about anything but playing time and sit and talk with them and, and whatever. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I think so many situations you can get worn down and, and, you know, to where it's just really, really hard. My advice would be, at the end of the day, you know, man, it's just basketball. You're just getting the coach. You know, you're you're part of a team. Um, you know, and and enjoy the in, the journey instead of the destination is the way I always looked at it. I was never a guy that like, um, you know, oh my gosh, we got to win or or we're failures and um, you know, just the the, the journey. In 1990, we were the number one four eight team in the state, undefeated. 30 and 0 and got beaten the first round of the playoffs. And um, you know, by a very good team that was well coached by Kenny Williams and oh. and uh just got us, you know, just got us. And um it, it, it uh you know uh people still to this day, many, many decades ago, but asked, oh my gosh, that still hurts you. And and I said, no, not really. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I think about it. You know, we had a team that could have won a state championship, was extremely talented, won a couple of 5A tournaments that year, won the Whataburger tournament. And, um, you know, but at the end of the day, the journey was unbelievable. We had crowds that were incredible. The town was electric, you know. Um, and, and so I've always been an enjoy the journey type guy instead of, gee, we've got to reach this destination. I, and that's the best advice I think I could give any coach. I really want to thank you for um, that reminder about being happy where you are and how important that is and not necessarily constantly looking on or forward to what's next, what's the next biggest or best situation that I could be in. Um, because I think there any coaches that do listen – we're all competitive, 
and we all see maybe what other people have. You know, I'm at, I was at McKinney High School with Wes Watson, and, and to, to kind of go from that level, that size of a school, to Grapevine Faith Christian School, where we're a 5A TAPS, we have 343 students, half are boys, you know, so that's who, uh, and we don't recruit, so that's who, uh, <laughs> who, who we have, and, but there's, over the years, I mean, there's just been this, sometimes this feeling of, you know, what about there? What about there? What could you do? But then I think, man, my son is here. Uh, I, I love the people here. I love the students. I love what the school stands for. So I think, you know, maybe today just talking on here with you, if, the, if, if nothing, I can't wait to talk about the style of play, but if nothing else, that reminder from someone like you that has had so much success, but has been at, at where you are um, for that for that long. I really appreciate that. I think I needed to hear that. Well, thanks. I, I truly believe it. Uh, you know, I, I just think that uh, you're right. As coaches, we're all competitive people, and we always look and say, "Gee, man, I wish I had that guy or this situation or this or that." But you know, at the end of the day, I just think you know you the the saying in the book that I've never read but I've always heard it's great make the best place where you are I can't remember the yeah exact title. make yeah. the big time where you're at make yeah. the big time where you're at yeah. yeah yeah so George Barber at Greenville uh was the one that uh turned me on to that that book I you know I haven't bought it yet because if you go on Amazon and look for it it's like 57 dollars because there's only a few copies out there like <laughs> so yeah. maybe maybe that's a Christmas present for me. I don't no know. Kidding. But, I've, uh, yeah. I've always wanted to. I don't know why I've never read. Wasn't the guy Frosty? Yeah, yeah. There's Frosty just not a lot of. Or, yeah, it's an old book. Not a lot of right. copies out there. So uh, maybe one of us gets his hand his there hands on it and then we share it or share it. That'd be great. <laughs> Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Biology. What's your BSA score? The Biology Skills Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NAIA, NJCAA, and a growing number of NCAA coaches to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This four minute, 40 shot test can be taken free today on the Biology mobile app. Elevate your game. Yeah, you, you've kind of alluded to the style of play that you shifted to um, and, and that you love. Man, I love to hear just how you teach it and what you love to teach? Well, like I said, we, uh, you know, we've been blessed here. You know, I, I read a lot of things on social media about coaches. They can't get guys in the gym. We have to beat them out of the gym. And it's been that way for decades. We're, we're, we're a bigger size school. You know, we have 900 to 1,000 kids most years. But we're we're still that small town that leaves the gym open all the time. Love that. You know, we don't, we don't have to have a coach in here. We open the gym. Our, our back gym, there's kids that come from communities all around, and then there's games, people are playing. It's locked down every night about 10 o'clock. And, um, you know, show up, and here we go. And, um, you know, part uh, one of my favorite stories of all time is I came in one Sunday night, and it was some little older guys that were out of school, and nearly every one of them had been in trouble with the law, having a four-on-four game on one end. And I thought as I left, you know, they said, man, we'll shut it down, coach. I said, okay. I knew one of them was an ex-player around an, another sport. And I said, uh, no problem. Hey, pull, push the door shut. I'll let you guys stay a little bit longer. Well, uh, you know, a lot of situations, you wouldn't have left those guys in that gym in a, in a million years. But I knew in our community, even with their reputations, they were going to take care of that gym. Wow. And sure enough, you know, everything was in place. Trash was picked up. The door was locked. And so, you know, that that goes a long way with, with having that type of support and community and being able to do that and everything. But our guys love to play. You know, people play. They, they love to play at our school. And like I mentioned before, being Air Force Base related, we, we, had, we always had a bunch of guys. You know, we looked around and um, – and we had we had a lot of guys. It wasn't a lot of difference in our thirteenth guy and our second guy, you know. And everybody's pretty good. And we're playing six or seven people, and so man, we just decided to make the switch and to really start playing a lot of people and go all in and and press full court and and then just play up tempo and really get busy and and get after it. And uh, 
you know, it's, it was the best thing we've ever done. It's kind of been our our identity, you know, and, uh, you know, that we're going to press you as soon as the game starts. We're not going to let up, you know. We're going to get after you from the start and everything. So, you know, and it's a fun way to play, you know. Uh, um, funding and staffing a lot of times in, in our public schools and, and at Grapevine Faith, you know, it's tied to how many, how many kids you got in the program, mm. you know, and uh, – so, like I mentioned before earlier, once we uh, uh, started that, man, numbers increased. Kids wanted to play, became more fun. Well, you know, it's a lot easier to get funding and, and staff when you have those uh, situations going on. But we just we, – we really jumped all in when we did it. Then we said we're going to press full court. We're going to run. Loyola Marymount was really popular then. And, man, just running on mates as hard as misses. I've read – studied every single thing that I could that they've ever done and and uh you know tr- every book that's ever written so you're that. a West Hedian I, I didn't I didn't know that about you oh, that's yeah. awesome oh yeah oh yeah not cut now he probably would say no you're not you know because we're not, <laughs> we're not we not we can not completely sell out there's still a little of Coach Stockton and Mr. Iba you know in the uh, you know we, but you uh, take you take the good you know you take the good that fits the situation where you are um, but then you also find out that style that just rings true to you and that you enjoy teaching. I think that that's really huge. Well, uh, and, and Matt, I just, this just popped in my head. I hadn't heard it for years, but somebody one time, the uh, best compliment I think we could have ever been paid was that we play uh, super up-tempo basketball with old school fundamentals. Mm. And, and so I thought that that was really neat that, you know, we're not throwing it around the gym. We're not, we've got a plan. We're not, you know, it's not just pick up, although it may look like that to somebody, but, uh, you know, we, uh, players making plays, not just running plays that, coach. That's right. That's right. But, uh, you know, just the, we feel like the combination of everything is what works for us. Um, really pushing the ball made miss, turnover, whatever it may be, uh, playing as fast as we possibly can. Speaking on that, you know, when I first started coaching, you know, in any fast break situation, we've always been in a district with Wichita Falls, Hershey. We're about eight to ten miles apart, big rivals, thousands in every game still to this day. Really, wow. really a neat deal. I mean, gym's packed. Our gym holds 22, 2300, and it's nearly full every time. Theirs is a little smaller, and it's, it's full every time still to this day. So it's, it's fun. It's we've made them better and they've sure made us better, but we could never keep them off the boards in any fast break shot. I'd drill on it. I'd, I'd work on it. I'd harp on it. I'd preach on it. And then once we started running and shooting faster, I realized, heck, it, it's almost impossible to try to get back and stop the break and then to get offensive rebounders off the glass if you do miss. So, you know, on the offensive end of it, we just felt like that, uh, that's a huge advantage. So many, there's so many great defensive half court coaches. Yeah. And you get back and you have to deal with, uh, you know, my gosh, through the years, all the guys, I, I think of Randall Durant at Keller in that 3 2 zone. I never figured it out. Leslie Broaders and his amoeba at Canyon Randall. Uh, I can't figure it out. Uh, we, we launch a bunch of threes. If we make them, we got a chance to win. If we miss them, they win. And, uh, you know, and then the great man to man guy. Tony Wagner, Destacata, Tim Thomas, all the places he's been. Yeah, it's so tough when you get back there and you try to – they're set up, they're dug in, and now trying to play against them. So I think there's easier offensive opportunities in transition and certainly easier offensive rebounding uh, opportunities. So, man, that's our offensive end of it. Then defensively, you know, we're just going to press and just hit you as hard as we can. And uh, we'll change the press based on – you know, personnel some years to do it a little different, but uh, we're go- we're going to just get at you and just try to go as hard as we can, trap you, we give up. You know, there's going to be easy buckets sometimes, but you know, we're uh, we've always said if they oop it and dunk it uh, while they're looking around a little bit, we're going to kick it in and go and let's go get another one. There's been numerous times it's really a fun time when somebody dunks it on us instead of hanging our heads or calling a timeout. We really work. I always show them video. When we played Dunbar and they had Jeremy Smith, you know, I said, he's going to dunk it on us. And uh, But we really take pride in kicking it in, running down, getting a bucket, and then pressing them again. You know, Coach, when you play that, that style you're talking about, 
you mentioned early on, you'd much rather be in a game that was 85 to 81 versus 45 to 41. So there's some defensive purists that they cringe a little bit when they hear that. But how did you get, because I'm right with you. I'm not as worried about, especially if the other team is playing the way that we want them to play. I'm not as worried about their score climbing up as long as we have one more point than them at the very end. But how did you get to that? Because of the you, the legendary coaches that you played for and were around. Well, you know, uh, like I said, there's still a lot of that in me. And, and um, you know, there's times later in the game that uh, we'll get out of the press. If, man, a team's going through it and we just feel like, you know, we're eight or nine up and, and um, you know, it's late, we're going to win the game if we can stop easy buckets. And so we'll we'll stop pressing. We'll get out and do that, and uh, and 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 you know not press any longer. And um, you know, but there's also times when I regretted doing that. And, uh, <laughs> one comes to mind: a 2008 state championship game against my good friend Doug Gro- uh, Groff and Kennedale. It's in overtime, and we're hurting them with the press in the second half a little bit. They had a great team, man, really good players, very well coached as always by Doug and. Uh, we scored to tie it up where it's going to go in a second overtime and I get us out of press and we go back and then they take it down and they score against our half court defense and beat us <laughs> oh. in the state championship game. So, you know, it, it just, uh, I still have that, um, uh, that, that defensive feeling. Okay. And, and then I've never felt like that. We just made things easy. You know, I've seen some up tempo teams to where they just don't play defense at all. They might full court press, but, you know, they won't take a charge. They don't dive on the floor. You've seen them, Matt. Yeah. They don't, they don't, they're not going to hit the defensive boards. You know, they're not going to scrap for loose balls. And, and they, it's, it's they're just a soft defensive team. We've always tried not to be that. Even though we were going to press you full court, you know, we wanted to be able to do all the little, little things defensively, you know, that would make us a tough defensive team. Even if you got some, you know, uncontested baskets, I always tell guys that when you're going to play us, Work on your uh, layup lines, you know, so you can get ready for your layup. So, but anyways. Well, to, to that point, though, I, how do you, when you're talking with your players, how do you get them to the point where they understand because we're pressing, one, the scores on both sides are going to be higher. There's more possessions in the game. So, like, I always tell our guys, you know, when we did, we, my first few years of faith, we were pressing a lot and, and, and have, we've actually gone to that three two that you alluded to from Keller, which is funny uh, that that you that you mentioned that. But um, and, and not many guys can figure it out. It's it's fun. But uh, how do you how do you get them still valuing the defensive end getting stops? And it, uh, but I because I think when you they are getting scored on a more and there are some lifts because transition offense is easier than half court offense, like you said. How do you get them from just not caring anymore about getting scored on, only wanting to go on the offensive side? How, how do you deal with that balance? Well, we 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 always talk about our big four things and um, things that we can control. You know, we're as you can turn on the NBA playoffs tonight, somebody's going to shoot it poorly. You know, and uh, and let's worry about what we can control. So for us, our four things we say we've got to be great at every night. We got to run as hard as we can. We have signs all around our locker room, uh, and we carry it with us on the road. I got it from Jim Calhoun at UConn. We will run until they quit. Mm. And so we're, we we got to run as hard as we can. That's the first thing. The second thing we've got to, we've got to rebound. It's the whole game. I really believe that. I think rebounding, you know, on both ends of the floor. You have a great offense if you hit the offensive boards, and you've got a great defense if you limit them to one shot. So we've got to rebound as hard as we can. And then, you know, we've got to play what we call killer defense. We can't make it easy. You've got, you can do this every night. And then we've got to own the loose balls. They belong to us. Any loose ball, because, in a, you know, you know, being an up-tempo guy and a pressing guy, man, balls get hit, deflections. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's a ton of, of 50-50 balls, and, and those have to be ours. So we just try to really that that's our four big things right there that we say we've got to control every single night. And 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 we always felt like if 
you know, that we weren't just, you, you got to be tough to play. I mean, uh, even if you were a really good scorer in our system, I won't say I didn't play you, but, uh, you know, if somebody else could play more minutes or, or uh, playing better defense and rebounding better and hustling better, that they probably were for sure going to be in at the end of the game, you mm-hmm. know. But, uh, but so we tried to make it an important thing through the years, and, and I think our guys responded to that. There, there's sometimes a debate out there about is it system over the players you have? Like you can fit any players into your system, or do you have to change your system based on the players that you have? Uh, over your career, where did you line up in that? Well, we, um, like I said, we'll tweak our system a little bit, but but the basics of it, you know, running that, running hard on, on any offensive possession, make, miss, turnover, uh, pressing some type of press full court, you know, we're, we're going to stay with that. Uh, we do it in the middle school. We do it in all of our sub varsities. Um, a lot of the youth teams around here are coached by guys that played for me, and they do nice. it. Nice. And uh, so, you know, and using the same terminology, our defenses are, defenses are numbered per Coach Stockton and Coach Iba. And so uh, I enjoy it when I see these youth teams play and they, they call it, you know, the defenses are numbered. And and so it, it's it's a neat deal when you when you see that. But um, we'll, we'll make adjustments offensively. We're going to um, stick with the break, but then – you know what, what's what's going to work for us this year? Do we have a really good guard that can penetrate? Okay, we're going to set some things up here. You know this type of shooter. Do we have a a three that could post up low but still play outside? So you know we we really make adjustments offensively more than defensively. Even though we will, you know we'll we'll maybe go instead of a full court one two one one really hard to maybe a little softer two two one and uh, and do the same things like that to make it uh, fit our players. But, uh, you know, for the most part, we're just going to stay with the same thing. And I've never been a an in-and-out guy either, five in, five out. Usually mm-hmm. the only time I'll do that is if uh, I'm mad at them. They're not hustling, you get them out. You know, I might use some little different language than that, but get them out. If they won't rebound, get, get them out. Go get them. Go get them, you know. And so – but that's about the only time – or. Uh, extreme fatigue situation where we two platoon we look at each position kind of um, on, on the talent of the guys you know if we have a really talented guy say playing our two guard and his backup may say a great score really good player and he's not you know he's not near as good well we'll you know the, the playing time will reflect that you know we've had players where we've had come out sit down get a drink towel yourself off and you put yourself back in mm. When you've caught your breath, you put yourself back in. Then other that positions. It takes a lot of trust right there between does, you and that player. It does. And those are few and far between, but we have done it. Yeah. And uh, the um, the other positions may be, you know, more equal guys. So, man, we just we just try to, uh, you know, run guys in and out. And, and the, the playing time will basically be equal. So, uh, you know, each position is kind of different and everything. And, uh you know that that's something that we just kind of, you know, go by feel. We may those change that changes year to year. Mm. Just like I said, you know that the style of play will basically remain the same, but little little things inside it will change. I think that's an important distinction, though. Is I think great great coaches like yourself. What, what some of the things I've seen in common is they do they know who they are, they know how they want to coach, and they do have a style of play and a system. But it's it's never too far either way, like because some guys can say this is our system, and I'm going to make you play this way every single year. We're not going to budge. We're not going to change. I think there's some problems with that. There's other coaches that every year we're different. We can do a different offense. We can we can do a different defense. We are fast. We're slow. It's whatever. And I, I see some issues with that, especially with building any kind of continuity from year to year. I think the balance that you have of, I have a system, but within that, there's some wiggle room, there's some tweaks, there's some things we can do. I think that you're right on the money there. Well, that's something we've always tried to do. And, um, you know, we, as coaches, we need to put guys in positions where they can succeed and, and not fail. I was always a one-three-one guy. Uh, the last year I played at Midwestern, Jerry Stone 
Midland Junior College national champion, longtime coach, great guy. Um, Drill Stockton, of course, playing for Henry Iba was all man to man, but uh, Coach Stone showed a one three one pressure matchup zone, and um, that that um, he played when he had Spud Webb and won the national mm. championship at Midland, and um, and he brought it to Midwestern that year, and that's where I learned it. So I was always a one three one guy until um, you know around two thousand had Matt Gibson was a six foot nine, nearly six foot ten, three man. And, um, you know, he signed with the University of Oklahoma and had a great career, uh, junior college in Hawaii and different places. And we had him out there 28 feet from the goal guarding as a young player, their quickest, fastest guy. And, and you know, so in the offseason, we said, well, we must be the biggest dummies ever. We've got to adjust <laughs> this. And so we went to a two guard pressure zone front and moved him to the back line. And so that's the kind of things we like to, you know, to, we, we think as coaches we should do to put our guys in the best place to succeed. Coach, that name, Mac, I haven't heard his name in so long, but we played on the the Fort Worth Lions yep. for summer ball together. Uh, and I just remember thinking, like, this guy, he, he's so big and so offensively uh, gifted. And then it was fun to get to see him, you know, at, o- at Oklahoma and when we go up to shake hands you know, or, or in layup lines, like, look at each other. But – that's so cool. I, I, yeah. I, I remember now, I remember him playing for you, but just, I just haven't heard that name in so long. Yeah. Doing great. He's an attorney in uh, Portland, Oregon. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah. Portland. How'd he get yeah. up there? <laughs> uh, University of Hawaii met a girl from Oregon. Oh, well, that makes sense. There so, you go. Yeah. Ended up, ended up on the West Coast. Coach, if you and I ever went out to Hawaii to, to play or to, or to coach, I don't know if, I don't know if I'd leave. I think if I got out there, I'm staying. (laughs) That's right. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Shoot360. The future of basketball has arrived in Dallas-Fort Worth. Shoot360 combines the latest sports technology with the fundamentals of basketball skill development. The result is a -a one-of-a-kind video game-like basketball program designed to improve your shooting, dribbling, and passing. Visit Shoot360DFW.com to learn more and register for your free one-hour workout evaluation. Shoot 360, the future of basketball is here. How do you teach shooting in your program? Which it's important because when you're going to allow your guys the freedom to shoot as much as they do, you got to have a lot of emphasis on it. So what are your, what are your philosophies there? I'm a little bit different, I think, than a lot of people that, uh, you know, once they get to high school, they feel like uh, their form set. And man, I'm just, I want them to get repetition. I want them to feel comfortable. And I certainly understand that. But once again, being an Air Force school, man, we get guys in that, uh, you know, one in particular, I had a player in the 90s named Chris Nobles, and he was an incredible athlete, fast, quick, jump out of gym. And literally shot it with both elbows out like that when he came in. He moved in from Alaska as a junior. And um, and I said, we just got to break this down. We got to start all over. I mean, that's obviously late and everything like that. But uh, And then his senior year, he was an all-region player. And, man, could really stroke it. He, mm-hmm. But he put in a tremendous amount of work. But we're always going to tweak with guys' shots. And this is the time of the year in the spring when we, we really like to do it. We film you as a shooter. We let you see yourself. We'll show you things that you know we like you to do better. Um, we have a player on this year's team, even though I'm retired. I, I saw him in the hall the other day, and I noticed him playing in a spring league game, and I told him, I said, if you'll add three feet of arc to your shot, you cannot believe what percentage you're going to shoot, how much better you're going to be, because he was really kind of a flat shooter, and uh, he, he, he did. I saw him take three or four threes, and I wanted to tell him, man, that's – just keep getting reps up now. You've got the feel of that and whatever. So even in high school, we've always tinkered and changed with shots. We mm-hmm. don't just, um, you know, we want, we think we you can improve, you know, maybe hold your finish a little bit better. Maybe, you know, a little less motion before you shoot. So constantly we, from every level, we go through a shooting drill routine. And um, I won't say we do it every single day, but it's pretty close. So we're going to form shoot without the ball. Form shoot real close at the basket with the ball. We tell them air balls are great. Glass balls are great. We're concentrating on form. 
you know, and uh, and then we're going to uh, back up and form shoot a little further back. And then we're going to get five shots apiece where we're going to hold the finish. You're not trying to make it. We just want you to stroke and hold the finish, hold the finish. If it's an air ball, it's great. Glass ball, it's great. And then we're going to take five shots where you're going to arc the ball up. You know, we're, once again, we're not we're not trying to uh, uh, make the shot. If it goes in, it's great. But we want you to get that feel of shooting with a good arc, that little feel of, you know, that good shooters have of being able to arc that up. How do you teach that? Where do you, what do you say, you know, shoot it up a little higher. And and um, my grandson, one time when he was about five or six years old, I was trying to tell him to shoot a little higher. And he said, oh, you mean like kind of over a hill? You know, I said, that's it. I'm going to start using that. So, <laughs> and uh, but we go through these drills and then we stop and we always say, okay, now we want your habit to take over. Through, through little daily doses, we're going to try to change your habit through the spring mm -hmm. and summer. That's really our main focus time to do it. And um, we're going to try to change your habit. But once you start shooting, all we want you to think is it's in. Be aggressive. Be a, be a strong, aggressive shot with your legs. And, and, you know, drive it up well and just think it's in. Don't think about anything you tried to work on. I've always equated it to my lousy golf game, you know, which I said, you know, I'm supposed to keep my left arm straight. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. But if you sit there and think about all that, of course, you know you won't hit the golf club. So, you know, we just won't have it to take over. But we we really try to make some changes in guys, even if they're a little old, you know, about, um, you know, do this to maybe a little bit different. Let's work on it and try to drill it. So kind of different, I know, but uh, it's been successful for us. I, I think it's a great reminder because I've definitely been guilty of, getting a junior or a senior here at faith and really just allowing them to do mechanically, whatever they do. So I think that's a, that's a really good reminder that not to necessarily give up on their shot that they can make little tweaks and improve. Well, and, and Matt also, sorry to interrupt, but um, I good. have had players move in that, that I didn't make that change. One guy could really shoot it and have kind of a flying elbow. And uh, there's another so great point. Senior year and, and let's go, you know, let's go. If and, some guys yeah. have the ability, and it's it's yes. athletically to have what we would call poor form, right. but still be able to throw that dart at the same target almost every time. So why tinker with it? So there there is a point where let's just look at what the result is. And if it's, it's what we want, certain. then let's not mess with it. Yeah. That your idea of of when you're doing your warm-up shots not worrying about makes where did you hear that or or when did you come up with that because that, like to me that's a huge shift in teaching players how to shoot is taking the worry of making the shot away so that they can truly just think about improving their form where did you get that from i'm sure i've heard it from somebody but i've just done it forever okay you know, that, that we want you to just you know, man, just work on that stroke. We're really big on um, on shooting without the ball, form shooting, you know, just really, man, spread your hands wide. So many kids today, their hands are tight. Yeah. You get a good, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And just little things like that. We, we say you ought to be driving your mom crazy around the house by form shooting so much, you know, and, and you can sit on your bed, you can listen to music, you can, you can do whatever, but you can form shoot and just, just try to really tighten that stroke man. up, you know. And so we wanted to free free them up from not we don't care if you make it. We're really just concentrating on you, man, getting that elbow in. And a lot of times we'll we'll give them something specific. Okay, right now, you know, hands wide, hands wide, everybody's hands wide, you know, and and then uh, right now, hey, make sure in, in your mind it's not in the pad of your hand. Your fingertips have the little slight arc to them. And then, you know, hold the finish. Let's get that middle finger pointing straight down, you know, Shashevsky's Reach in the cookie jar. Let's be yeah. high. Okay, and let's have your um, your arm by your ear. You know, just little little drills like that maybe. And, and to not think about necessarily making it goes in great, but but just to try to focus on the, the physical thing that we were trying to give to do. That's a great nugget, though, for coaches to, to take away from this is give your players time and opportunities to shoot without any goal in mind as far as how many makes in a rows is their time. Like all of those things are really useful with teaching 
shooters how to shoot game shots at game speed. You, if you add a component like in a rose, if you miss, this happens, or a time, that, that helps. But there has to be a time for them to shoot without consequence, to focus on anything. And, and because anytime the make is involved, I've just seen guys care so much about that that they're unwilling to take a chance or make a change. That's, that's exactly right. You know, it's a foreign concept a little bit to them, you know, that they're trying to, to drill instead of just, you know, put the ball in the basket, which we're, you know, we're trying to ultimately do. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of times, um, you know, many years ago we, we looked and, you know, you're starting practice. Well, invariably somebody's got their locker won't unlock. They lost their top. You know, they don't have socks that day. You know, everything you won't kill them for. So you get out there and, and there's that practice, you know, everybody's kind of standing around, they're visiting things that, you know. So I said, this was early on in my career. I said, we're going to come out with a specific thing every day. And when you walk out there, we're either going to do a zigzag ball handling uh, segment that we do, or we're going to form shoot on the side. And we'll tell you what it's going to be that day. Hey, it's form shooting. We'll, or, and so you're at a goal with the ball. There better not be conversation. There's been days when we walk out there and I'll get on the line, put the balls up, you know, and uh, because that's not what we're talking about. And we're usually out there. One coach at least is out there, you know, but but we're coming out every day starting like that just to get that get that shot up, get that shot going and, and go from there. Coach, I got to ask you, uh, I, I, I ask many, many coaches this question. And sometimes there are guys like me that, you know, only 15, 20 years into it. And so still hopefully a lot of time left, but some things that we've definitely learned along the way, but on this side of, of your career and, and the, your, the next journey that you're going to, that you're going to take on, what are uh, some things that if you could go back that you would do differently or maybe learn earlier, or it's possible that there's nothing. Mm -hmm. No, there's always, you know, I think we, as coaches, the nature of, of who we are, that we're always second guessing, you know, what could, okay, what could I have done better here? What could I have done better there? And, and um, you know, there's times when um, I, I wish that we would have been a little bit more multiple defensively. You know, I played mm. for Charles Stockton, who played for Henry Iba, who almost invented the way man-to-man -man defense is, is played. Uh, you know, I, I find it so neat when they're talking about pack line defense and everything. Well, back in the day, that was called zone A. If they drove into zone A, there had to be a collision. You know, something had to happen in zone A. And and so, uh, you know, and, and as I coached, I, it took so much time to teach man, good man-to-man -man and um, that we just went more with that pressure zone. You know, and I don't, I don't want to say as a cop out, but it probably was just a you know, we just, we, it was easier. We still wanted to get that great ball pressure. We never want anybody to feel comfortable in the half court if we're not pressing and we're just in ha any half court D, we want constant pressure on the ball. But but looking back, I wish I'd have, I'd have stayed more, being you know, more man to man mm -hmm. and uh, to be able to use the, the switch. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I thought that that was really something um, uh you know, that, uh, that would have made us maybe better to, to be able to do that, just to be able to switch like that. You see, um, you know, especially, I guess the shot clock's coming, you know, on these days and everything, but you see those college teams, you know, they'll, what, being a pressing guy, I call poke and press. They'll pick up like they're really going to get after it, but they're just trying to eat some shot clock up. They'll just kind of right. drift back and then boom, they jump right back into their, their man defense. But I found that, you know, man, if, you, if you're multiple like that, I really think you could become a, a, a really a lockdown defensive team. And one of Bobby Knight's books I read, I remember him talking about something he would have done different was at a certain point through the shot clock, uh, switch to a zone because they're predominantly man to man. So you yeah. play man to man, then, you know, at a certain point, you want to switch, you switch and go. And, and to, at the end of that possession, you know, it would be really tough. You're going to show them one look and do another. And I know people do that now, and and um, I've just never – I wish I'd have been more multiple like that, a little more, you know, instead of, okay, here we go, we're going to do this, this, and this. And um, I think our product would have been better. Yeah. I, uh, I, I feel like when I'm talking with you or listening to you today, 
it's kind of, it sounds weird. I feel like, I don't know if I'll have the wins that you had or the success, but just the philosophy, it's like I'm talking to a, a, a version of myself, maybe, <laughs> maybe in the, because I, I, I think a lot in the same ways. There's times where uh, I'm so locked into what we're doing that I'm not that flexible, even, even in the moment. Like, I, I don't think I'm a very good halftime adjustment guy. I believe more in that stay the course, keep grinding, it will turn, it'll start to take effect. And where there's maybe been times where I thought, man, I, I mean, uh, w was there something I could have done to help our guys adjust a little bit more? Yes. So I just, uh, yeah. Uh, you I, know, I, I, there's been times where your team responds, you know, you come out at halftime and they play much better or start the fourth quarter and you shut a team down and, and people will say later, oh, that was great coaching, man. <laughs> you know, what'd you do? Play harder. Play harder. Yeah, Stuck play with harder. the same thing we do. <laughs> Moved on the fly to the ball. Yeah, like that's <laughs> Well, Coach, Tommy Thomas uh, and a lot of other coaches feel like they know you, but after the speed round, uh, they're really going to know you. So these are going to be short, quick questions, just first thing that pops in your head. You ready? All right. All right. Uh, favorite ice cream flavor? Vanilla. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? I would like a shot clock. Going to be hard to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the best things I've heard, besides after you pay pay the money to get it installed, is to have officiating crews instead of a three man crew send a fourth guy that is actually that's his job. And and if that if that could happen, I I could see that taking away some of the I think burden or issues. It's going to be getting volunteers to be working that thing. Yes, I hadn't heard that, Matt. I think that would be a Phenomenal idea. Yeah. Um, texting or talking? Uh, talking, definitely. <laughs> what about big, with big, you? What? Big fingers. And yeah. <laughs> different generation. Yeah, that's true. But the, the, those players now, I find it a lot easier to get response from them from texting. But do you still demand, still demand that they talk? i tell you what, I'm kind of old school on that. Well, you know, you can listen to your music going to a game. But once we're in the gym, you hit earplugs, uh, pods are out, and yeah. headphones are off. We're gonna talk to each other. You mm -hmm. know, in the locker room, we're gonna we're gonna talk to each other, and and so, you know, I I just I make them do it, and it, you have to, you know. And uh, man, that's so, a good little nugget right there. there. That's a you good know, nugget look, there. Look me in the eye and talk to me. Tell me what yeah. you're feeling. Let's let's how are you gonna do this with your with your boss? Don't avoid problems. Confrontation mm. is okay, you know, and. Uh, you know, I'm sorry I'm rambling. <laughs> no, you're good. No, I was just thinking, though, like before games, when they're sitting watching the girls watching JV, what a great idea to have them put their phones away. But even from a performance standpoint, get them, get their eyes off of a screen and out onto the floor, get their mind thinking about what I, I think that's just a great reminder for me. You know, maybe in the future, I, I put that in like, yeah, on the van, you know, on the bus, you guys are going to the game, no problem. But once we're in there, let's tuck that thing away and yeah, let's, let's talk to each other, but let's get our mind right. I'd like that. Let's start thinking about us. Yes. You know, nobody likes to listen to music anymore. And I do always tell them uh, individually, and you wouldn't like the music I listen to, but, uh, um, you know, we need to start thinking about us. Uh, favorite holiday? Oh, uh, well, uh, um, Christmas. Nice. This is kind of a weird one. Invisibility or super strength? Uh, invisibility. Mm. If you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? I would go to um, the, the Western days. Nice. The nice. Western days. Have you ever seen the movie Open Range? Yes. Oh, love it. One yes. of the best ones out there. Um, all right, two more. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? I, I haven't had a cup of coffee since I probably tried it when I was 12 or 13. This is my quote on coffee. Nothing on the planet smells so good to taste so bad. So true. I'm, I'm so a one, one Coke in the morning guy. Never okay. drink Coke again. I have to have one Coke in the morning. That's it. Coffee smells so good. I know I'm supposed to drink it. I'm an adult. 
I try to take the taste of it. It's horrible. Oh, I love it. Last one. And, and the, the answer to this question could also be neither, but uh, Godfather or Star Wars? Godfather, without question. Never got into the Star Wars stuff? No, I, of course I did. And, and yeah. I did really again when my grandson. Oh, nice. man, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And so we watched the old ones and new yeah. ones. And, and Old ones I, are better. Old they ones are. are better. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I enjoyed watching them with him. But, uh, yeah, I'm a Godfather guy. Well, Coach, I just tell this was such a pleasure uh, for me. I mean, very our, much fun. Our paths haven't crossed much, you know, over the years, but – uh, I've always heard about your teams. I've been able to watch them a few times, like at the Whataburger tournament, uh, you know, back when our faith team played there. Every coach that I've ever talked to, you know, when your name comes up, just holds you in such high regard. So I'm just so humbled that you would take the time to talk with me. Oh, man, I've really enjoyed it. it it's been so much fun, and, you know, just to talk basketball and do it. And it's been great. I got to leave you real quick with one Tommy Thomas story. Yes. I don't think you were on this team, but they were playing Wichita Falls Rider, and um, whose coach was Nat Lund, a college teammate, and one of my closest personal friends. And um, Tommy back then was taking teams overseas during the summer. That's right. And he would, he would get groups of teams. They'd go all over. And, and so the game's going Rider's favor. It's at Rider. He's getting ex exasperated by the officiating, you know, as he could. All of us can. And he turns around to his fans and screams, Wichita Falls, the only place that you get cheated worse than Red China. And uh, <laughs> we've laughed about that for, for years, that he, he would do that, throwing his arms up, you know. Oh. Yeah. That, that was probably after he the jacket came off, oh, the yeah. tie came off. The oh, sweater yeah. came out. Like, he always would end up in just the dress shirt at the end of the game. Yeah. That's great, man. <laughs> oh, well, coach, thank you. I got to ask you, what's, what is next for you? Like, what, what do you, what's your next project? What, what are you doing with your free time? Oh, man. I, I you know, uh, my granddaughter and grandson are in seventh and ninth grade. They're athletes. I didn't get to see, I got to see my grandson play one time this past year. Didn't like that at all. Yeah. So, um, uh, they live in Wiley. My daughter's in the administration in the Wiley ISD. And so, uh, you know, we'll spend a tremendous amount of time down there and uh, got a lot of fishing to do. I always ask people, have you ever been fishing in Montana? And they say no. And I say me neither, but I'm fixing to change that. And I don't know. I probably own 10 guitars through my life. Never learned how to play one of them. That's something I'd like to do. I'm yeah. a live music guy. I love live music. Nice. Blues rock guy. So. That's I've a good a question. To I got to add that question into the uh, into the speed round. What kind of music do you like? That's a good question. Thanks, Coach. Oh, um, right. But, hey, thank you so much, man. This was a blast. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.